In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, that instruct the hearts of your faithful by the way of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lady Fatima, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Father Lanteri, pray for us. Saint Nation Loyola, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome you all to our spiritual exercises program with St. Ignatius of Leola. It's great to have all of you. And starting tomorrow, as is my custom, I will pray for all of you and I'll offer a novena for you starting tomorrow. So starting tomorrow as a special intention in the Mass that I celebrate every day, I'll place you on the altar so that this will be the most important transforming 10 10 weeks in your life, and I believe God is going to hear my prayer. So that'll be my my gift to you. I can't offer you limousines or money or new houses. (laughs) I have a vow of poverty, but I can offer you something even better, and that would be I'll offer you prayers, and especially the greatest prayer is that of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Amen. And I invite you also pray for me and my intentions. I'll be praying for you, and pray also because tomorrow we've got another group, those who speak Spanish. We'll have our Spanish one tomorrow, so um, pray for the two groups. It's, it'll be simultaneous, but just changing the language. So there's really a lot a lot to be said. Uh, the first session of the exercise is what I, I try to do, I try to cover three uh, basic topics in this uh, first session. And the first is I want to speak briefly about St. Ignatius of Loyola and then I'd like to talk about, I'd like to give you some ideas on how to meditate, okay? how to meditate, how to pray. Then we'll give you the, the foundational exercise for all the exercises, and it's actually called Principle and Foundation. So all the exercises are built upon what is called principle and foundation. So we'll try to try to be as succinct as possible. All right, our our method is the following. Uh, we give a, a, a talk, a lecture, which will give you the orientation of what you're going to be doing the whole week. So that'll be the first the first part. We'll give you a talk on where you're heading. What are you going to be doing the week? What, what will your meditations be? Okay, the second will be after our conversation today, we will divide you into groups and starting next week you'll be, you'll be sharing on what you meditated upon. So we've got a lot of space here and I've given the exercise many places Place, but this is the best because actually I live here, so I know the environment. Other places I'm kind of floundering where it's where to go. But here you got many classrooms. You've got classrooms here. You can have the sessions right here. There's uh, there's um, a sacristy. There's just a lot of space here. So this is probably the best place in L.A. to give the diocese right here. And also, if we don't have enough photocopies, we've got the machine right behind me. You know? So. Uh, 
And then the third part will be, I'd like to explain to you on, on how to meditate. Uh, all of you have heard the word meditation. Some of you have done the exercise, but I'd like to give you kind of a little coaching on what are the steps to make a, to make a good meditation. So that's our, that's our tripod. Talk, share in groups, and then we have the most important part will be your, your daily meditation. Is that clear? All right. Um, even though I've, I've read The Life of Ignatius uh, more than once and seen movies on him, I always uh, try to get to know him better. Um, so I was able to Google in last night and I got an article written by the Xavier Institute by a nun and a priest which was about the best six-page summary of his life I've ever read. Uh, you, I would invite all of you to, to buy his autobiography. It's actually, it's only about 70 pages. It's not very long. So I invite you to read his autobiography. There are many versions. And also I invite all of you to try to see the movie that was made in the Philippines about eight years ago which is the life of St. Ignatius. Uh, have any of you seen it? I mean, it's not, it's not perfect, uh, but as an intro to his life, I think it's pretty well done. And the scene in Pamplona where, he, where there was a battle between the French and the Spanish, that, that's my favorite scene, where the cannonball breaks through the wall and basically shatters his legs, no? So the movie's pretty, it's pretty, pretty well done. Not, not perfect, but I'd say I'd give it a B plus, no? So get to know the saint. Get to know the saint. So uh, trying to be as succinct as possible, I try to go through his life because unless you get to know the saint, you're not going to really understand his spirituality. It's like if you want to get to know uh, the writings of Teresa of Avila, you have, to, you have to get to know who Teresa of Avila is. You want to get to know uh, the diary of St. Faustine, you have to know some biographical elements of St. Faustina. Same thing is about St. Ignatius of Loyola. You have to get to know the person. And pray to him. Pray to him. So here we go. He was, uh, he was born in Spain, in the Basque area, northern Spain. And he was um, born in 1491. He was the last child, as was Francis Xavier, his companion. He was the last of 13. Okay? Like Father Dave Jankowski is, he's one of 13 also, no? Thirteen is a good number. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, and if you go to New York and you go to the big skyscrapers, there's there's uh, room number twelve and fourteen, but there's no no thirteen. I'm speaking like a New Yorker now. <laughs> well, we don't believe in superstition, do we? No. Want to get me angry? Say, good luck, Father. <laughs> there you go. God bless you, yeah. Oh, buena suerte on, in French. Bon chance. No? God bless you. I don't believe in luck. Nothing happens by chance. God knows how many hairs you have on your head. Robert, right, Robert? Yeah. <laughs> He's a bald guy, you know. <laughs> Once heard uh, someone said, um, you know why you lose your hair? In the front, because you think too much. In the back, because you work too much. If you lose it in the front and the back, it's because you think you work too much. Huh? <laughs> right, Robert? Okay.
Do any of you know what ASAP stands for? A-S-A-S-A-S-A-P. You know what that means? No, always say a prayer. Amen? Hey! (laughs) Got to be baptized, huh? You've got the paganistic interpretation. I've got the supernaturalist interpretation. Amen or oh me? Amen, right? All right, so he's born in 1491, one of 13. I was exposed uh, to the lives of the saints, at least to a limited degree, when I was a child. And my first, the first form of life was uh, Dominic Salvi. I read when he was 12 or 13. By The author was Peter Lapin, which is French for Peter the Rabbit, no? And um, I thought as a child that the saints were born saints. I thought that they were born saints, that they, you know, they didn't, they were just very holy. They breathed in another atmosphere. They didn't have to go to the bathroom. I mean, I thought all these things. (laughs) But then in time, I came to the keen awareness that the saints, the saints are like us. and They have a lot of flaws, a lot of sins some more than others. So St. Ignatius in the category of, of the saints that lived very worldly lives before they underwent a conversion. Like Augustine. You've heard of St. Augustine. Like Mary Magdalene. Like Mary of Egypt was, who was a prostitute before she was converted, No like uh, Camillus de Lelis. I make it go give you a whole list of these saints that lived pretty spicy lives before the Holy Spirit invited, invaded their lives. I, th- because I think it's really encouraging because we're all sinners. We're all sinners. We're all striving to go beyond our sinfulness. So... Uh, Ignatius, one of the saints, was in and out of jail. Did you know that? Yeah. He'd feel very comfortable with the Cholas of Hawaiian Gardens. No. I mean, he was, he was in and out of jail. He was a tough guy. I think, I think that the modern Cholas would be afraid of him. I mean, he was a tough guy. So, by he came from a very noble family. They were religious, but didn't really really live a very holy life. They were Catholics by name, as you have today. So there's a real similarity. You know the biggest biggest religious group in our country are non-practicing Catholics. Did you know that? Biggest group are non-practicing Catholics. When I was a child, 80% of the Catholics went to Mass and 20% did not. Now, 80% don't go to Mass and 20% go to church. And I'm talking about two generations. And at the end of these exercises, your people are going to be bringing people back to church. By the time you finish these exercises, you're going to be like a spiritual magnet bringing Christ to others and bringing others to Christ. Amen? Amen. That's my high ideal of this noble group of individuals. No? <laughs> Say thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so by profession, Ignatius, he was a soldier. So what type of, what type of person was he? He was... He liked to drink. He was an excellent dancer. He liked wine and women. He liked to fight. He had his own dagger and sword. I mean, he was a a tough guy. He was vain. He liked to dress 
elegantly, like St. Francis of Assisi. I mean, he had almost, almost all the capital sins that you have, he had them. And pretty too, pretty too high, high degree. Some autobiographies say that he, he could have had an illegitimate child too, like Augustine, no? Uh, so he wasn't a milk toast, no? He was a tough guy. But God is going to change him. So here we see this very worldly, sensual, angry, uh, proud, vain individual. And he's, a, he's, in, he, he's, he's in a battle between the French and the Spanish. Now, the French had a much stronger army, number as well as artillery, than the, than the Spanish. So he was ahead of a squadron of, of soldiers, and he said to his soldiers, let's fight the French. They all said, no, because they're too powerful. We can't win the battle. So Ignatius says, we can win the battle. So the battle was fought in the movie, the movie made in the Philippines is my favorite scene. Because you see him at the top of a fortress. He's fighting off individuals. He's killing them right and left. And then you see the French army encroaching with their horses and their cannons, and their bayonets, and their rifles, and their shooting. And all of a sudden, you see one of the French soldiers aiming the cannon with a cannonball, and he crashes right through the wall, right at Ignatius, right at his legs, shattering his legs. There he is laying there, half dead. And the French were so impressed at his courage, I mean, they could have killed him right away, no? They're so impressed at this soldier that was basically almost single-handedly holding back the French, this one guy, no? That they put him on a stretcher and they, they brought him back to Loyola. They, they could have killed him. But here he is now. And uh, the article I read last night pointed out a couple of things that never really occurred to me. Part of his, part of his personality was he was really um, proud of the fact that he was handsome. He was a woman's man. He was attractive. He was prestigious. Now the guy can't. He can't even walk. He's going to be losing all of his his, his attractiveness. He's never going to recover it again. He's never going to be able to walk without a limp. I mean, every, all, all the vanity he had, God eliminated with one cannonball. I mean, how God can work. Incredible. In one second, that vanity was crashed and crushed. God can do that to us, too, if he wants to. God knows how to work with us. He knows how to pulverize within us. That's a strong word, isn't it? Pulverize in us what's not good. So he's taken back to his castle in Loyola. Now there he, there he is with basically both of his legs are ruined, one worse than the other. We might have some people here in the medical profession nurses or doctors or medical assistants. They had to break his leg with no anesthesia. Then they had to break it again because the first break was a lousy job. I have an older brother who, do, who does reparatory spine surgery. You know what that is? It means the doctor is botching and my brother's got to put him back on his feet again. So it was done poorly the first time. 
But then, now all this is without anesthesia. Are you ready? Okay. Below his knee, there was a bone protrusion of about an inch. He told the doctor, saw it off. His brother almost fainted. And he just clenched his fists and he barely moved. I'm saying this not to scare you. But see the, see the willpower he has? Once he's converted, all this energy is going to be directed to praising God and to saving souls. That I hope for all of you. You have energy, so do I. But it's dissipated. It's not properly channeled. Be honest. It's dissipated. We want to channel our energies to praise God and become the greatest saints in the world. That's the purpose of the exercise. So after these painful operations, you can imagine that the convalescence is going to be very slow. But providentially, so nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens by chance. So what's going to happen as a result of this convalescence, this is a providential accident. He's going to be starting his process of conversion. Conversion is something that there, there can be a radical conversion, but also after the radical conversion, then there's a daily conversion till we die. All right. Now I'm going to tell you right now is is one of the hallmarks of Ignatian spirituality. And I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question. I'm not saying this to uh, disparage your your keen acumen or intellect, but how many of you know how to read? Okay. How many knew how to read 500 years ago? Very few. Because it was, this was before the Industrial Revolution, before the printing press. So what you have is very few people knew how to read and write. Uh, Ignatius and Teresa of Avila, they knew how to read. Teresa of Avila, too. Teresa Avila would never allow a nun to enter if she couldn't read. Because she could be autodidactic. She could learn by herself. Ignatius, not only could he read, but he loved to read. But telenovelas. (laughs) You know what that word is in Spanish? La telenovela? He, he, he loved to read the chivalrous tales of the knights in shining armor okay, with the damsel in distress. He loved that. So the romantic tales, and he was a page in the court of Spain also before being a soldier. So he knew the court life and he wanted he wanted one day to possibly marry the Queen of Spain. So he wanted to be someone famous. So he would often think, what, what would I say, what my romantic words be to win over win over the Queen of Spain? And he didn't have any Shakespearean sonnets to Quote, because number one, Shakespeare spoke English and yet Shakespeare wasn't born yet, okay? <laughs> so what he did was this. He wanted those books, but his relative couldn't find any of those books. So they brought him 
the lives of the saints. Yeah. <laughs> that was the last thing he wanted to read. So what he did was this. Given that you didn't have TV and radio, his, his, his imagination was very vivid. Our imagination is dulled because of the social media. <clears throat> his imagination was very vivid. So he would imagine himself dressed in elegant clothes, talking to the queen, and what he would say, and he could spend hours in these chivalrous, romantic, ideal dreams. And he spent hours doing that. He had a lot of free time. And when he was doing it, he experienced pleasure on the surface of his soul. Then he was cast in to, here's a key Ignatian word, desolation. You're going to be hearing that word in these exercises. He was cast into desolation which is basically a state of sadness. But then, then he did open the lives of the saints and the life of Christ by Ludolf of Saxony. So there's the life of Christ and the lives of the saints. He started to read the lives of the saints and it's almost as if dynamite exploded in his soul. He was fascinated by these saints. And you read his, boy, uh, his autobiography, he, he wrote saying, well, if Dominic can do it, so can I. If Francis can do it, so can I. If Augustine can do it, so can I. If the Desert Fathers can do it, I'll beat them. And he read the lives of saints. When he was reading, he was on fire. But after he finished that interior fire that stayed with him. Very interesting. The romantic memories, pleasure, desolation. Lives of the saints of Christ, consolation when he read and he stayed with the consolation. From that, my friends, we have the beginning of the art of spiritual discernment. And St. Ignatius is the greatest in the world. We are going to be teaching you the art of spiritual discernment. Applying this to yourself. All of you will understand this. You do certain things that maybe cause you a certain amount of pleasure, then you feel sad afterwards. Whereas there are other things you do that when you're carrying them up, maybe there's a certain amount of peace and afterward that peace and joy stands with, stays with you, right? You understand that? So we're introducing, and that's key. Very important, the art of spiritual discernment. People will come to me with interior battles or thoughts. I was, I'll often... This is my style. I'll stop and say, where does that come from? And I purposely make you to rewind that and ask, okay, does that come from good spirit or the bad spirit? And 95% of the time, the person hits the nail on the head. Sometimes the person's off the mark and I'm saying, this really, it really does come from the good spirit. So constantly you have this dynamic within you, the good spirit and the bad spirit, 24-7. But unless you do the exercise, you're not going to be able to pick up the vibes. In Spanish, they say, las buenas ondas, las malas ondas. No? <laughs> so you have to learn the art of spirit to discernment to, ex to accept the good ones and then to reject the bad ones to be as simple as possible. We have a priest in the Oblates who spends just probably almost many, many seminars, Father Tim Gallagher, who's on EWTN, 
Uh, some of you have probably heard of Father Tim Gallagher. He's an oblate priest. He goes throughout the whole country giving a lot of talks, but a lot of it is based on the art of spiritual discernment. All right, so there he is. He's recovering. But it's a slow process because of the shattered limbs and the bad operations. And But he arrives at a point where he's, he's ready to start moving. And he decides that he's going to become a pilgrim. And some of the autobiographies of Ignatius are in Italian, Il Il Pellegrino, if you know Italian, which means the pilgrim. Spanish, Il Pellegrino. Because you're going to see in the life of Ignatius, he's a pilgrim going from one place to another. And I'll highlight the... um, the most important places where he's heading. By the way, all of us are pilgrims too. A pilgrim is someone that's heading toward an ultimate destiny. Our ultimate destiny is to get to heaven. So we are pilgrim people. Okay, so after he recovers, he's a pilgrim. He wants to go to, you've probably heard of this place before, Montserrat. 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 It's a famous Benedictine Marian sanctuary on the top of top of of a hill. And many girls, I mean, you're Filipino as well as Mexican, they'll, they'll choose that name, Montserrat, which is a beautiful, beautiful name. They don't know what it means, no? Uh, but they should. It's really, it's really a name for Mary. Okay? It's a very famous Marian Benedictine uh, monastery. So he's heading toward Montserrat on a donkey. And on the way, he meets a a Muslim. And he's on the donkey and he's talking with a Muslim about theology. And the topic surfaces on Mariology. And Ignatius is explaining to this guy one of Mary, Mary's privileges is her perpetual virginity. One of the four Marian dogmas. No? And the the Muslim violently opposes that dogma, insulting the Blessed Mother. Ignatius is infuriated. So he's arrived at a fork in the road on his donkey. And he says, if the donkey follows him to the right, I'll kill him in in honor of Our Lady. (laughs) But if the donkey heads toward Montserrat, well, I'll spare his life. Thanks be to God, it was a Catholic donkey. (laughs) Good up to Catholic donkeys, huh? Don't say that I'm married to one of them. No, don't say that. (laughs) So, He arrives at Montserrat. What is he doing there? Okay, he's spending long periods of prayer. He's practicing penance. He's in silence. He's examining his conscience. And he's going deep within his soul, seeing all the trash the moral rubbish, trash, he's accumulated in these years of his life. He's in his late 20s. So he arrives at the point where he wants to make a confession. This is called a general confession. So he finds a priest, goes to confession, 
Have all of you been to confession in your life? Yeah. Yesterday I heard about a hundred confessions in five hours in a retreat there, Il Sembrador, no? His confession took four to five days. Can you imagine that? Your confession is not going to take four to five days, no. However, the the priest that heard his confession was blown away at the at the delicacy of his conscience. This is another fruit that will become more evident to you as a result of these exercises. Your conscience is going to become more delicate. You're going to have a more refined conscience. Some people have a very obtuse, coarse conscience. Most. Some have even you know, killed their conscience. Or they're living with a suppressed conscience. Because the closer you get to the light, the more you can see the spots on your white dress. huh? So the closer you get to the light, and God is light, the more you're able to see with greater clarity things that are really, really not pleasing to God. So the priest was really blown away. A confession of five days. See his conversion? Okay, the conversion at Pamplona. Reading the lives of the saints. And now you're going, you're, going, you're going deeper. Okay, then something else happens in which he's a soldier. Now he's going to become a soldier for Christ. This is very common in the in the Hispanic and the Latino cu- uh, culture, is to have you're standing in front of the Blessed Mother with a sword, okay, and you spend the whole night there in front of the Blessed Mother. So Ignatius did that, and this is not a dogmatic fact, but it. Could have been, this is my conjecture now, is that he was given the grace of perfect chastity through the Blessed Virgin Mary. Most people battle with that virtue their whole life. But when God is going to choose someone to carry a very sublime mission, that person has to really have chastity. As in Thomas Aquinas and Faustina, and these great saints. How is God going to work through an impure vessel? So, it's through the Blessed Virgin Mary that these graces are going to pour. Then after he finishes his time in Montserrat, he travels to a place, he's a pilgrim now, to Manresa. Montserrat, Manresa. Now, there in Manresa, his state of soul is different. In Montserrat, he's basically just in a lot of consolation, preparing for the confession, praying, fasting, encounter with the Blessed Mother. He's kind of in a wave of consolation. Now, on Manresa, he's spending a lot of time in a cave there in Manresa. There's a cave in Manresa or he's spending long hours in prayer, but also he's going out and he's doing some type of apostolic work. But he's plunged into a very deep state of desolation. And I would have to say that behind this desolation was, uh, was the enemy, the devil. He was cast in a state of desolation for a long time. So he prayed and he fasted and it seemed to get worse and worse. Then he was, he was tempted to commit suicide. 
Because the devil was saying, you're not going to be able to put up with a life of penance for another 40 years. And he's fasting for a whole week. He talks to his spiritual director who says, I fast, I'm going to spend another several days. And his director says, no, start to eat now. So he eats and obeys his director and it disappears. By obedience. No? Well, actually by eating. How important it is to learn how to obey. How little is appreciated the virtue of obedience today. Now the reason why the devil was attacking him was because there in Manresa, in that cave, he's going to have a mystical experience that will change his life and change the lives of millions of people until the end of time. While he's there in Manresa praying, the Blessed Virgin Mary appears to him and she dictates the spiritual exercise to St. Ignatius Loyola. So the exercises come from the Blessed Virgin Mary. So as Saint Faustina is the Secretary of Divine Mercy, Saint Ignatius is the Secretary of the Spiritual Exercises dictated by the Blessed Virgin Mary. Like that? As an oblate, I love it. (laughs) These exercises are given from Mary. You can never go wrong if you're in the hands of Mary. Amen? Never go wrong. So we're going to be placed in these spiritual exercises in the hands and heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Okay, Pilgrim. Okay, so see where he's, what's happened. He's in Loyola. Okay, he's brought up and raised in Loyola. Then he goes to Pamplona, Pamplona, Montserrat, Montserrat, Manresa. Now, he wants to go to the Holy Land. Biblical experts call it the fifth gospel. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Holy Land. They call it the fifth gospel. He wanted to go there and kiss the ground on which our Lord walked. He wanted to venerate Bethlehem and the Mount of the Transfiguration and Lake Galilee and Calvary, and the Holy Sepulchre. He wanted, he wanted to see where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ lived. It was very difficult for him to do it. And once he arrives, he spends some time there, but the Franciscans, who were in charge of the Holy Land, told him to get out because of the danger of the Muslim threat that they they could they end up by killing him. So he didn't want to, but they lifted up a document, otherwise you're excommunicated. Okay. So he spent some time in Holy Land, but then he had to return to Europe and Spain. Now what he's doing is this. Whenever he meets someone, he's always talking about God, Always. I mean, he loves God so much, he just, he, he's talking always about God, and with a lot of enthusiasm. But he's also giving people the exercises. So he got the exercises in Manresa, but they, they, they were developing in time. Manresa, he had the blueprints, but he kept developing them. And he came to the spiritual exercises. You're doing a 10-week program with me. This is called Annotation 19, the program that I wrote. But the original exercises would be a month retreat. You go off to a month retreat with a director and he's directing you during a month and there's no no talks, you just pray and you talk with the director once a day. That's the original pristine exercises. But most of you cannot go off for a 30-day retreat. You can't do that. But you can do this. You can come once a week and you can do your meditation. So in the exercises, you have a lot of what are called annotations or adaptations 
For example, the teenagers, I wrote a program, some of you have teenagers, I wrote a program for the teenagers, Annotation 9, 18. It takes this program, cuts it in half. Five weeks, meditate a half hour. I wrote that 10 years ago. So the exercise, they lend themselves to adaptation. I've written the exercises for toddlers, too. <laughs> haven't? I have. I haven't launched it yet. I already have written it. And I've also written it for the elderly. So you can adapt the exercises according to everyone. And given that we're oblates, our charism, we know how to do it. That's our, that's our charism. And I have many, many, many defects, but I tend to be very creative. You know? Very creative, especially with the exercise. So, he comes back, and now he's given the exercises, but he's got a, he's in his 30s, he's got a fourth grade education. He's got a fourth grade education. This is the time of the Inquisition. So the ecclesiastic authorities come and say, what the heck are you doing? You're not a priest. You're not a bishop. You're not a deacon. You're not even an altar boy of that, huh? (laughs) But what was happening, he was giving the exercises to the most simple, humble farmers and to priests and bishops and lay people, married, single, with a radical conversion. Irrespective of the social class of the person, people were being transformed in 30 days. So I said at the end of Mass today, if we don't learn how to meditate, we're going to be mediocre. There's no way around it. We're just going to be typical mediocre Catholics. But if you learn... To meditate, we can transform ourselves from being turtles to eagles. Amen? Yeah. Do you prefer to be a turtle or an eagle? An eagle. Yeah, Yeah, you want them to win the Super Bowl too. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Okay, so there he is given the exercises. And there's these radical conversions. This guy, he doesn't even, he's not even graduated from elementary school. So they tell him, stop doing that. So he didn't obey. He's thrown into jail. They question him. He's not a heretic. He gets out. They throw him into jail again. So he's thrown into jail about three times. And it dawns on him that he's got to go back to school. So he's getting close to 30 and he's studying at school with kids that are 9, 10, 11, and 12. And they're faster learners than him. I'm talking about humiliation. He's trying to learn the Latin and they're picking up quick and he's got to go back and try to learn it again. But you see his, his perseverance you know, and his humility. So he, he goes back to school and he's going to be going to these different places, Alcala, and he's going to be going to Salamanca. And from Alcala to Salamanca, he finally gets his high school degree. The, the, guy, the guy's got perseverance, but he's not a keen intellect, intellectual like Aquinas or Augustine or John Paul II. He's not. But he's got this dogged tenaciousness. So he ends up in the most prestigious university in the world back then. Let me tell you. <laughs> University of Paris. Okay. Okay. Where Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas taught years before. That was the the Harvard, the Princeton, Yale. Okay. Or the Oxford, the Cambridge. If you're an English woman, huh? That was the the most prestigious. And he went to uh, which would be an offshoot of it called Saint Barb, okay, which was a part of. 
Very fascinating. He, 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 now he knew that he had to get his college degree. He had to get a, he had to get a degree in philosophy and theology if he's going to be accepted. See how things work now. He didn't have money, so he had to he had to have roommates. He had to have roommates. Some of you, most of you went to college. My first year I had a roommate, then I had one of my professors that got me single as a sophomore, junior, and senior. <laughs> but he had to share a room with two other guys who were younger than him. Now these two other guys with whom he was rooming, they had a lot of hang-ups, a lot of problems. One of them was a Frenchman who suffered from what we would say today in psychological language, an inferiority complex. A very, very low self-esteem. But are you listening? He was a first-class genius. You have someone that maybe have a low self esteem It doesn't mean that they, got, they don't have an intellect. He was brilliant. So Ignatius took him through the exercises. And he was radically transformed. And he went, on to be, he went on to become the greatest expert of the spiritual exercises after St. Ignatius. And Pope Francis, who's a Jesuit, you probably know that, Pope Francis canonized this guy four years ago. His name is Saint Pierre Favre. Okay, maybe you never heard of him, but he was one of the original Jesuits, La Compagnie de Jesus. So after giving the exercises, Ignatius was the best, but then Favre was the was the second best after him. Eventually, he became a priest and give the exercises to kings and queens and bishops all over Europe. And he, he died, I think, in his late 30s. He died very young. And he became an expert in giving the exercises because he did the exercises well. Yes. You people can become great saints if you do the exercises well. Hello? Anyone home? <laughs> Depends on you. If you're really open, God's grace is super abundant. It's a question of opening our hearts to God's grace. Now the other guy was the exact opposite. He was the polar opposite of Favre. He, uh, he was an extrovert. He was a socialite. He loved life. He loved parties. He would have been. He would have made it to the Olympic Games today as a high jumper. He was an expert, like John. He was like John Paul II, an expert in languages. Um, a man just with all these talents, but he was proud as a peacock. He was arrogant, and Ignatius tried to get him to do the exercises. And he, he looked on Ignatius because he was older, walked with a limp. He kind of, he saw him kind of as a, as a weirdo. Kind of a weirdo. So Ignatius was going after this guy, trying to get him to do the exercises. And he's like the other guy, he's brilliant. He gets his doctorate in philosophy. And he's teaching there at the University of Paris, this guy. So this guy is, is so gifted. Finally, Ignatius convinces him to do the exercises. And he takes these guy, this guy through the exercises and Ignatius says, this was the hardest nut to crack. <laughs> he gave him penances. He told him to t tie ropes around his legs because of his, vine, uh, his vanity. The rope started to, to grow within his legs, no? I mean, Ignatius gave it to him. 
But then those ropes were cut because he, he reckoned, this guy's proud as a peacock. He's very strong. I got to break his pride. And the guy collaborate with him. He, fin- he finishes the exercises. Then he who despised Ignatius became his best friend. He looked on Ignatius, now he becomes his best friend. And he's considered the co-founder of the Jesuits. So Ignatius, he's He's got seven companions that that want to follow him. They 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 see him as kind of a weird guy, but this guy's a saint. So they travel. They wanted to go back to Jerusalem, but they couldn't. So they go to Venice and they plan to go from Venice to Jerusalem, but there's too much tension between the Muslims and the Catholics, so they never go back to Jerusalem. And where they go is they end up by going to Rome with a group of the seven companions. They go to Pope Paul III. They ask Pope Paul III if they would, if he would approve of this group of men. And he says yes. And what we have is the Jesuits, the company of Jesus. Ignatius with the first seven followers. Salomon, Lainez, Bobadilla. You got... Uh, Pierre Favre, and then also another great man that followed him, who was right right hand man, and the Pope, the Pope, they, he professed four vows: poverty, chastity, obedience, and being 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 willing to go where the Holy Father sent them, at the beck and call of the Holy Father. So the Holy Father wanted to go to India, because the, the church back then then was just sent to where? In Europe. So up until the 1500s, the church was cent- was centralized in France, Spain, Germany, Austria, Holland. Okay? But the Pope had a missionary spirit and wanted, hey, we've got to get out of Europe. Let's go to the Far East. So he turns to Ignatius and says, could you give me, can you give me a couple of your priest to go to the to the far east. And Nasus pulls out two and these two guys they get sick. So his right hand man, his secretary, the cocky guy, <laughs> he turns to him and says, Will you go? And he says, I will obey. And Ignatius says to him, You go now and go set all on fire. There's a book written, Go Sit All on Fire, a book. So he embarks from Portugal, from Portugal, ends up in, in Goa, India. And this guy, he's preaching and teaching and baptizing and converting thousands. But for him, India was not enough. So he goes to Indonesia, from Indonesia to Japan. And he's converting the Japanese. Then he had an idea. The best way to convert the Japanese is through the Chinese. Because the Japanese look up to the Chinese. So I'll go and convert the Chinese. So there he is on the island of San Chan, overlooking mainline China. And he gets a fever and he drops dead. 46 years old, working only 11 years in India and Japan in the Far East, converting thousands and thousands of souls. And that man is the great St. Francis Xavier. The great St. Francis Xavier. So what I've done, I've told you the, the story of three saints. The domino effect If you become a saint, you can help others to become saints. You can. Ignatius was instrumental in the conversion of the greatest expert in the exercises, Pierre Favre. An instrument in the greatest missionary after St. Paul is St. Francis Xavier. 
You do the exercise, my friends. The sky is the limits. Amen? Amen. All right, what I do in the first session is this. Uh, the first session, just the first session, I have two talks because there's too much material to cover in, um, in just one talk. So what I'd like to do now is we can maybe take five to seven minute break okay? so we can stretch and maybe go to the bathroom and then you'll hear a, a bell in about seven minutes and I'll give you the second lecture, okay? <coughs> Glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we'll see you in about five to seven minutes. You hear, you hear the bell ring, okay?